Carl M. Cannon, author of The Pursuit of Happiness in Times of War. What gave you an idea that this would be a book? Well, Brian, I didn't, I didn't know it was a book right away, but I had been asked by a, a magazine, Forbes magazine, to do a, a, a piece about the living presidents. They were doing an end of the year thing on the pursuit of happiness. And they said, could you interview some of the ex-presidents or get them to write? And so I did that, and it was a funny thing. I'd heard presidents say, you know, life, liberty, in the pursuit of happiness a hundred times probably. I never really thought much about it like most Americans. Um, <clears throat> But then 9-11 came, and I had this stuff in the can, these interviews. I, um, I emailed George H.W. Bush, Bush 41, said, you know, do you want to change anything you wrote? It's going to look kind of maybe frivolous. And he wrote back and said, no, no, I don't. And he'd written about his happiness of his personal life and his wife and his kids, and he'd taken pride in them. And uh, I, thought, I thought there's something there. I didn't know what it was. And then after 9-11, you remember Rudy Giuliani and Bush sort of emerged as these commanding figures, but before 9-11, they had, Bush had been as marginal a president as a, as a president can be absent a scandal, and Giuliani had made himself into something of a joke. Suddenly, within hours in Giuliani's case, and in, he'd emerged as a hero, and within days in Bush's case, he's emerged as this forceful wartime president. And I thought, all right, what did they do to transform themselves? What, what were they saying? And what they were saying was, in Giuliani's case, he was telling Americans to go to the theater and go shopping, and Bush was telling people to go to baseball games and Disney World. He even said that once. And I thought, all right, are they, what is this? Are they missing the boat? And so then I began looking into this, this language of the preamble, which both those men cited. The pursuit of happiness, Americans' right to pursue their heart's content, even during war. And I wondered if these two were right, or if they were all wet historically, and I decided to look into it. Did Forbes publish the article? <laughs> Forbes did publish the article, and... Uh, what what and, was the date on it? It was, you know, December of 2001, and it was, and it was all kinds of leaders, not just presidents, but all kinds of people. And, and that, it was Forbes ASAP, it was mostly a, you know, business, sort of pursuing your happiness, your dreams, and entrepreneurship is what their thing. But the presidents interested me at this point much more than business leaders, and so I began to look at all the wartime presidents back to, really, well, even back to Jefferson and even George Washington. Had you ever <clears throat> thought about the Declaration of Independence at any great length? No, not really. Not like a lot of Americans. I think I, that language is out there and I like it, but I had never really even written about it. Where does it come in the Declaration? Well, it's right. It's the preamble. I, I, I carry it around with me since 9-11. You know, it's, it's right here. It's the very beginning. Can I read you the first couple of sentences? Sure. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth a separate and equal station which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinion of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. And then Jefferson starts the causes. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and that they, are endowed, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that's, so the preamble is only, you know, the beginning of the declaration. And I only take the beginning of the preamble and build my book around what those words mean to Americans and how wartime presidents and other national leaders in times of crisis have used those words to galvanize Americans. When did Forbes magazine specifically come to you? What was the date? Do you remember? It was summer, maybe sp spring of 2001. So before September the 11th. Right. What, what got them interested in Well, the they person? just said, I think they do it. This was an end of the year project that they were doing, and they were looking for a freelancer to help them. I'd written some stuff for them. I, you know, I cover the White House full time, as you know, and uh, for National Journal. They're very good about letting me do an occasional project like this. So Forbes called, they were just interested, they were just kicking it around. They had no, of course, inkling that those words would take on a greater meaning very soon. When they came to you, did you consider yourself a happy person? And do you consider yourself a happy person now? Yeah, I do. I, I do. I, maybe that's just ignorance on my part. But yeah, I'm, I'm the, the last paragraph <laughs> in your book, 
a native of San Francisco, Carl attended the University of Colorado, majoring in journalism. He lives in Arlington, Virginia. He and his wife, Sharon, have three children, ranging in ages from 8 to 22. Carl pursues pursuits include fly fishing in Montana, thoroughbred racing, opera, and playing amateur baseball in an adult hardball league. Does that say it all? You see how my job gets in the way of my life? I'd have... <laughs> Does it? <laughs> but I love my work. Remember Phil Burton? You remember Phil, the congressman yes. from San Francisco? Every time I call him, I came to Washington and he was like my godfather, though Phil wasn't particularly religious or Catholic. But and he would, uh, he, ca I, I called him and he said, anytime you need me, you know, call me because we're old family friends. I never really did call him and I feel bad about it because Phil died young. But every time I talked to him, he'd always say, "Are you happy in your work?" And I realized that. That's really the key thing. Those other things are great fun, but if you're not happy in your work, you don't have much of a shot. This, I have a chapter on happiness, on what happiness is. At some point in the book, I felt, probably should have done it earlier in the book, but I did it late in the book. Well, wait a minute, what is happiness? And so I got, did research into the most current social science, and it's, it's, it's what you might think. Money does not make people happy. Riches and wealth does not make people happy. How but, do you know? Well, there's there are studies. People there are people who at these universities. This is what they do. Uh, David Myers is one. There's uh, there's others. But what does make people happy? Well, but very destitute people aren't happy either. They can't be happy really. Eleanor Roosevelt right talked about this, and I, I quote her. But for people in modern America to be happy, they they have to have a sense that their work means something, and that they're listened to in the workplace, and that they're contributing to society. I, these are very reassuring things to find out. So the article was published. Was there a reaction to it? Yeah, I don't know. I don't remember. So how do you get to the book, though? I mean, oh, well, I by this time, I had more I wanted to say, a lot more. And uh, Larry Sabato of the University of Virginia, another person you know, called me up and said, I'm doing this series of books on American political challenges. And what he's what he's really doing is trying to line up writers for this publisher, Roman and Littlefield. And do you have anything that you think you could write about American political challenges? I said, well, Larry, it just so happens I do have something. And I told him the outline of this book over the phone and then in an email. And he forwarded it to Roman and Littlefield, and they, they loved it. And of course, it goes against, I mean, my father's written many books, and all my friends said, that's totally not the way to do it. You have to get an agent. You have to do this. You have to do that. And this was an academic publisher who gave out a pretty small advance. But by then, I just wanted, I had something I wanted to do. I had something I wanted to say, and I just threw myself into it. Your father is? Lou Cannon. Who is? Well, he's a longtime reporter for the Washington Post and biographer of Ronald Reagan. He also wrote, he's written other books, including the Official Negligence, the book on the riots in Los Angeles. And he's a, he's a, I mean, I don't, he's a great man and a great writer. You know him. Yeah, see, he's one of the few that have had a two-hour book note sitting. Is that there. right? He did yeah. Luke, uh, Ronald Reagan years ago. Yeah. Uh, go back to Phil Burton, Congressman yeah. Phil Burton, yeah. Democrat from San Francisco, brother John, still out there, still in politics in Sacramento. Uh, how did you? How were you family friends? My parents, my mother and father, worked precincts for Phil in the mid '50s, and literally, I was campaigning for Phil in a. Pram. I was months old. I wasn't doing much work, but my mother was. She was handing out things, strolling me up the streets of San Francisco. And so my family has a long connection with the Burtons. My mother's native of San Francisco. And my dad moved there when he was a young man. He's from Nevada, and they met there. How, how did you get into journalism? And I mean, it's, it's obvious, of course, your dad was in it, but how did you don't necessarily always go your well, my, dad's route? Yeah, my parents didn't go into politics as it happens, though. They my they fooled around in politics when they were young, but by the time my father got out of the army and got a job driving a truck, and turns out what he'd always wanted to do all his life is be a reporter, and he became one. And I grew up in that family and never really thought of politics. And I didn't think I was thinking of journalism until one day I, you know, decided to go to journalism school. It just sort of happened to me, and I've grown up in that business. Where'd you go to school? University of Colorado. And. Along the way, how many different jobs in journalism? Oh, a bunch. Worked at newspapers in uh, Petersburg, Virginia, and Columbus, Georgia. And then the San Diego Union hired me. And then 
San Jose Mercury News, and they sent me here. I was in Knight Ritter Bureau for 10 years. And then the Baltimore Sun covered the first five years of the Clinton administration. And then National Journal offered me a job in 1998. And I, I was wanting to do magazine work. It was a fortuitous thing. And National Journal is just a great place for me. I want you to take us to a night you're at the correspondence dinner, the White House correspondence dinner. Mm -hmm. And you're now the president of the White House correspondence yes. dinner. You're seated next to the president of the United States, George W. Bush. Right. And you're in pursuit of information for this book. Set up the whole... Oh, well, it's funny. He, I was talking, you know, you're there at the dinner <clears throat> and, you know, you talk about everything and the rules of it, the ground rules are sort of unstated, you know. This is a great secret. I don't know if it's on the record or off the record and you know, but you know not not to ask because of course the president said well of course it's off the record and we were talking mean, and he'll talk he's, a, he's he's like Clinton in that regard he's a pretty good conversationalist he'll talk but two hours a long time we talked about baseball we talked about this we talked about that at some point I talked to him about this book and he had the funniest reaction Brian I've never printed this anywhere but I'll tell you he, he said uh, that sounds about wartime presence and he had been asking me about Roosevelt he's very interested in FDR and he said I'd read that. I said, well, Mr. President, you're in it. And he kind of laughed for a minute, like, oh, yeah, yeah I guess I am. But it was a funny how, how, In what way? I mean, did he, did he know how he was in it? And, and no, I mean, gotten, I, what had you gotten from him up till that point? Well, I had, you know, we were talking about, really, I was in the sort of final throes, and I wasn't really interviewing for the book. I had gotten some quotes from him earlier in the process. Um, and I'd read all his speeches, and I was I was sort of doing what you do. I was running by him these thesis about the pursuit of happiness and how and how human rights. And if you if you follow my book, follows the point that the thesis of my book is that is that the, if this country has a something a special mission, if American exceptionalism is alive and well, that mission is extending. Jefferson's unalienable rights to people who do not yet have them. And this book chronicles how presidents have wrestled with that. All the presidents before Lincoln who knew that slavery was wrong, even the slaveholders, but knew that it would take a war to end it. And finally Lincoln, war was foisted on Lincoln, but he didn't shrink from it. And beginning with African slaves and ending with, in my book, with the Kurds in northern Iraq, when this country is doing what it should be doing and doing it well, it's extending these rights to others. I talked to Bush about that, and he didn't say a lot, but he he um, clearly was intrigued by that idea, and had already spoken about it. You know, Bush himself has spoken about this pretty clearly. If that if those rights are unalienable, Jefferson's rights are unalienable. Well, then it's the philosophical corollary is that the desire for them is universal. Bush clearly believes that. He said so many times. By the way, when you're sitting, I mean, and very few people ever sit next to a president for two hours in conversation, what do you get and from sitting next? What did you take away from that that we may not get just watching him on television? Well, I mean, is he a happy man? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he is. And he's also, he's funny. And he's, he's just, he's very human. He's very down to earth. John F. Kennedy once observed that the Presidency is not a normal ambition, but and, and you think of them with some remove and 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 if Kennedy said that, I mean the that means it's not the ambition of normal people. So these people they all have big egos and they all. But the other thing is when you talk to them, it's always a surprise how human they are. I mean Bush at some point we had an entertainment. He asked me kind of how long is this going to go on? He said you know I've got the dish set. I was hoping to get home and watch a little of the Ranger game tonight. I mean he has he has sort of concerns like you and I have and that to me is reassuring I don't know if everyone would find it reassuring I, I took away from you in here and, and tell me if I'm right that you are personally philosophically for what happened in Iraq well I, I was very leery of it and I because I was covering it I didn't express any opinions but I, I think I had misgivings I, I think I thought it was perilous and very difficult but but once that's undertaken, I think it's probably good for the world if, if, the, if a democracy emerges in Iraq. I, I, I'm, 
I was agnostic before, but I'm not now. I'm really pulling for this thing to work. And I, you know, you talk to, I have dear friends who are Democrats, some who are working on these campaigns against Bush. And at some point after the day is over and we're having a beer, I said, look, it, it's help, more helpful to you if this thing turns south in Iraq, but you must realize it's better for the country and better for the world if it doesn't. And they privately say, yeah, I mean, if the price, if Iraq turns out great and the price is we lose the presidential election, that's probably worth it. So I don't, I don't think most thoughtful people really disagree with that. One other question on President Bush. Do you get any sense that he knows anything about history? He's always criticized in some quarters for not being curious. You know what? That's funny. Those are two slightly different questions. They He's are. very curious. How much he knows is an open question. He, I mean, he, he gave, found him to ask you questions. Yeah. And he, you know, he gave an interview to Brit Human, which he sort of boasted about not reading the newspapers. He said something along those lines to me that night, but differently. He said he doesn't read editorials and op-eds. He doesn't read the columnists who attack him. And, uh, I mean, he's in good company. George Washington didn't either. And the one time Henry Knox brought him a cartoon, Washington had a, a tantrum at a cabinet meeting, a tirade. Um, so Bush doesn't want to have tirades, and he, he, he wants to stay positive. But when he says he doesn't read the news at all, that's not reassuring. Um, I think it's true. I don't know. I don't know. He, um, but he's curious and he's, o he's open-minded in a way that, in person, that he doesn't come across in these speeches. I mean, he, the people he asked me about, for instance, were all Democrats. Humphrey, he's very interested in Hubert Humphrey. Humphrey's a closet hero of my book. Um, Politics of joy. Yeah, exactly. Did you know him, Humph by the way? I didn't, and my father did. I didn't know him. But Humphrey used to give these speeches in which he would say, you know, America's the only country where the pursuit of happiness is guaranteed. And he would open his speeches like that. I mean, it was a big thing to him. And he wasn't, it wasn't phony. He really was the happy warrior. Um, a, a phrase that was, of course, applied to Al Smith and FDR, but it never fit anybody better than Hubert. By the way, when you had your conversation with President Bush, um, and it's not established what the ground rules are. Did you go back home and write it all down? No, and I, I've been urged to do that by friends. I've been too busy. I should have done that. I didn't do that. So. All right, let's jump to Plains, Georgia. Yeah. What's that story? Jimmy Carter. Yeah, what's that story? Well, you know, Carter said <clears throat> some of the most evocative things about the pursuit of happiness. What, in fact, he, in his farewell speech to the nation, use this language, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and sort of put it in a modern context, what it would mean. And environmentalism is one of the things it would mean. And helping the nations, the world's poor. And Carter had a very, <clears throat> Carter had some thoughtful things to say. But this was old, this was 1981. And so <clears throat> I'm writing 20 years later, and I think, well, I wonder if he still feels that way. So I tried to get- But by the way, 81, he's out of the presidency already. Yeah, well, he's leaving. Yeah. He was, well, he was, it was 80, no, it was January of 81. It was when he was leaving. So it was his farewell speech, I think it was a few days into January. It may have been late December, but that's the time period. And then again at the 84 Democratic Convention, he gives a speech and he says these things, modernizing Jefferson's language, and, and in a way that's compelling. But I thought, well, does he still hold with this? And now after the attacks, what, would he have something extra to say? And it, it, Carter's always been hard to deal with, his operation, you know, you call, and the, can you get an interview? Well, maybe. And it went on for some months. And finally, I just thought, I'm going down there. And he speaks in his church um, semi-regularly. And I went down there just on the happenstance he would be there. And he was. The Baptist Church in Plains, Georgia. Maranatha Baptist Church in Plains, Georgia. And Carter gives what they call a s Sunday school. But what, what uh, in my, what I, my tradition, we would call a Bible study, really. But it, Carter comes out in the days he's there with his wife and he explains to the people what he's been doing in the previous week or month. And it's always a lot. He goes around the world monitoring elections. He's with Habitat for Humanity. I mean, he's, his whole life is public service and mission. And then, and then he has a Bible lesson of the day. And he really knows his Bible as much as, I mean, it's very impressive. So I was sitting in the front row. And you by yourself? I was by myself, yeah. I was actually sitting by a person I met who's a high school teacher from Florida who'd come up for the event, a man I didn't know. I should send him this book. What's anyway, the time frame of that, by the way? What, what year? <clears throat> 1981. 
This is October of 2001, two years, two years ago, roughly. In November, October, November. And you're there because you can't get to him. Right, right. And I think, well, I, but I, I don't, I'll, I'll be content to ask him this one question. Do you still stand by these words you wrote? That's the only mission you're after. And at some point he looked at me, and I've met Carter once or twice. I wouldn't think he'd remember me, but he, I must look like a reporter because he kind of looked at me and he didn't smile. This was during his lecture. <laughs> and after it's over, he and his wife meet every person that comes under these shade trees out and back. And they, if you want your picture made, they, they stand there with the picture. It's very gracious. And I waited to the line when I was the last person in line. I said, listen, I'm, and he sort of cut me off. He said, you know, are, I said, I'm a reporter. I've come, and he said, something like, you know, I don't do that at church. I said, well, Mr. President, church is over. And anyway, I've come a very long way to ask you one question. And it's a question of, was, well, what is it? Kind of snappish. I said, well, it's this thing. And I pulled out these papers, and I was a little flustered, I guess, and <laughs> to drop them on the ground. I said, well, it's about the pursuit of happiness. And you said some things. I want to ask you if you still... He softened, and he said, well, it's about something I wrote. It, what's the harm of it? He said, just, would you mind waiting over there? And he sort of directed me, and I waited until he finished up with the last few people. And then he came over, and he sort of dropped the armor, and he was very nice, and he, and he said yes, that he did. What he said then was as relevant in 2001 as it was in 1981, and that these attacks had not changed that. And he said, you know, there are always new challenges, aren't there? And then he spoke about his faith for a while. And it wasn't, it was no earth shattering revelation, but it w allowed me to make this connection that I was trying to make with these presidents to make sure that I was on the right wavelength, you know, that, I, that this book idea of mine was right. And my exchange with Carter assured me that it was. Now you, you flew from Washington to Atlanta and drove a car down there? Yeah. yeah. How long did that whole process take just to get this? Uh, you know, it took a couple of days. You had to go down the night before. And was it worth it? It was absolutely worth it. it Again, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think you wrote a negative word in here about a president. Mm, well, I didn't mention Nixon. <laughs> well, but I mean that the I'm point just... I'm making is that everything is maybe, positive. Maybe, maybe not. And I just want to know if that's conscious. Yeah, I'm trying to think, is that right? That may be right. I, I, there's, it's close, if it isn't It's right, close. There's I mean. some things in Wilson's first term that I don't think he quite got this, but in the second term he does and yeah that is that is conscious you know i we you and i live in a time now where the discourse in this city is seems angry and extreme and it's not the first time it's happened it's that happens in cycles um but i find in looking at this that the partisan issues that seem so big at the time don't seem big now and they don't and they don't even seem big to the people to the players Years later, you know, Bob Dole and Bill Clinton are doing TV shows together and lectures together. Um, Adams and Jefferson, their campaign against each other 200 years ago, you know, was maybe the meanest ever. We, we may have never surpassed it. Maybe 72, I don't know. Um, but they became very close friends. And, and so these issues, and, and what I'm writing about, I'm looking for something different, a different tone. I'm looking for how these Democrats and Republican presidents sort of rally their countrymen. And they all have much more in common to me, for my purposes, than they have differences. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm stressing, yeah, that is deliberate. And I, was, I, I hope that it's a tone that, that more people would adopt. It's, it seems we get a little breathless. How did days. you relate to Gerald Ford? Well, Ford, there were two of them I knew actually had some relationship with before I started this, and Ford was one of them, and Bill Clinton was the other. I covered Clinton for eight years, and he knows me. We're, we're not friends, but we're not adversaries. He always, res he always treated me with respect, and I covered his, you know, at some point, well, I had to cover impeachment, but I mostly wrote about issues, and Clinton likes that, and even if you write a critical story on an issue, he'll he can he can handles that well. He he likes the give and take. And Ford, I had won the Gerald R. Ford Prize for distinguished reporting of the presidency, and Ford had come and given the award, and so I knew him, and so I called them first. And Ford was just wonderful. He he said, "Well, I don't want to write an essay for you, but I'll do an interview." So he calls me up one day in August, 
hey, the weather's great. Come on out of here. I said, well, where is it? He's in Vail, Colorado. He was, I think, kidding around. We did the interview on the phone, and he was just very down to earth. Now, if, you know, and John F. Kennedy's the caution about president certainly doesn't apply to Ford. Ford's a very normal guy. Ford didn't really ever want to be president, so he never had that ambition. And, and Carter, who's the opposite, who had that ambition since he was 16, or excuse me, Bill Clinton, um, was also, uh, his staff sent word that he would write something for me, but could it just be on Jefferson instead of on the pursuit of happiness, which was a nice change of pace, really. You don't usually in a do an exact the exact same question of people, and he wrote something, and, and it was nice, and he surprised his staff by actually making his deadline. He's a notorious procrastinator, but he didn't procrastinate. He, he sent the thing right on time. And did he write it himself? It. Oh, yeah, I'm pretty sure he did. He, uh, it, yeah, it reads like him. So what's your take on all those presidents? Are they, are they all happy? I don't know that. That's getting, a little, that's getting a little beyond my purview. But I'll say this. If you, if you stand as I do, I guess this book shows it, that American exceptionalism is alive and well, that there is something special about this country and that we have something and duties that are special. You stand, if you, if you take that stand, you stand, you're in pretty good company. All 43 presidents, even Wilson, um, and immigrants. And that's the group, those are the groups oh, through time that I, and I'd be happy to, I think it's pretty good company to keep. And all those presidents have in common, whatever their differences, and you know, all, they all ran against each other in succession. They all believed that this country had something special about it. Where did those words come from? Did Thomas Jefferson actually write them himself? Well, I spent the longest chapter in there is trying to figure that out. Um, the short answer is he had a lot of help. These ideas had been out there. I mean, <clears throat> and in fact, I end up going back, I, gosh, I think, you know, before Aristotle. I mean, you, the far, you can go back as far as you want, but the idea that governments are instituted among men to, to serve the the people, not the other way around, predates monarchies. So it's an old idea. And the specific idea of happiness and the pursuit of happiness, this language is around. George Mason wrote it. Um, James Wilson, another Virginian, wrote about it. Franklin wrote about it. So these, these words were around, these phrases were around. And, and so what, and what Jefferson did was, was borrow this language, synthesize, in, in an era where that was the expected practice. We now today are very big on original language and if you borrow language you're a plagiarist and but in those days the emphasis was different if you tried to be totally original you were a show off and why would you do that when there was all this stuff you needed to borrow and what Jefferson did was build and put it together now having said all that I'm a writer Jefferson was the writer and that's a solitary thing and the, how was he well he was 33 and to and he went to <clears throat> Philadelphia with <clears throat> He had the biggest library, I think, in the New World. He didn't take a single book that anybody knows of. He goes up there with his saddlebags and pulls out a piece of paper. Now, the Virginia Declaration of Rights that, that Mason had written with help from Jefferson was republished in the Philadelphia newspaper. So Jefferson had this convenient document and some of the language about pursuit of happiness is in there. And where was he? <coughs> where did he write it? He was in a house called the Jacob Graff's house. He rented in the middle floors of a house that was, if people read the great Dumas Malone series, they'll say, well, the house was destroyed. But in fact, since that series ran, the house has been sort of, the city fathers in Philadelphia found out the address and have built a replica house. So you could go there and see. Have you been there? Yeah, yeah. I, went to, to the I went to these places. It was, it was helpful in a funny way. I saw the desk that he wrote on is in here in Washington at the National Archives. And I went and looked at that desk and somehow that helps. You mean, you mean Smithsonian? Yes, excuse me. In the president's exhibit you mentioned in there, uh -huh. you can go see the desk see where the he desk. wrote these words. Yeah, where he wrote these words. And that is the desk. And Jefferson seems to have known that that desk would, that people would want to do that because he, he kept that desk. He didn't keep everything, but he kept that desk and for posterity. And it was a sort of self-deprecating comment about, oh, nobody would care, but he knew that they would. And uh, yeah, that, that, that helps to do. I don't know why exactly. Another person you mentioned in the book a lot is Alexis de Tocqueville. Did you know who he was before you got into this project? Oh, sure. Did but, you read much about him? You know, they make you do that in high school and college, but I didn't. But what, what I write about de Tocqueville is how, 
how he how he gets he writes about this tension between materialism and altruism and it's still something that Tocqueville's most of his countrymen don't get the French still are disparaging of us all these years later but Tocqueville got it there they go together um, and this was uh, this was what this was what Bush and Giuliani were doing you know that America's power is not its wealth but it's it, it, it's the power of these ideas but it America's wealth allows us to defend those ideas um, the technology that we have that we develop these frightful weapons they allow us to defend ourselves and in fact go to to Iraq and impose our will if that's what we're doing and so Tocqueville writes about uh, write, writes about that and I stumbled across it actually there was a piece in the New Yorker by Adam Gopnik and and I found this and it was sort of like you know something you dream of with somebody would find the quote for you and here's the dream quote and Gopnik found it I I give him credit. I, I try to cite everywhere I got everything. Um, I think I did that. And you wrote long footnotes. Yeah. Well, those were originally going to be on the page, but my publisher thought that would be unwieldy. But the footnotes are, if anybody buys this book and reads it, I would urge them to read those footnotes because they help they help explain where, where I'm getting this stuff. I've got to ask you about one footnote because okay. it just popped out, <clears throat> and it's totally out of context. Page 299. I don't even know what chapter it is. I have to check. It's chapter 5. <clears throat> it's footnote 11. The pummeled constituent was a minor league baseball player named Alexander Banwert, age 36, who was promptly arrested by the Capitol Police. Senator Lodge claimed to be too busy to press charges. Perhaps the fact was that he was the aggressor, that he was the aggressor, meaning Lodge, played a role in his thinking, and Banwert, in a fit of patriotism subsequently enlisted in the United States Army. Such were the emotions of the time. This story has been preserved for posterity by the office of the Senate historian. What's the whole story around? Well, the story is the debate during World War I, whether to enter it. And, and then, as now, you know, people were questioning each other's patriotism, or really people thought their patriotism was being questioned. Maybe it wasn't. In Lodge's case, it was. And he's, you know, whatever he is, 65. And this other guy's an athlete and a young man, and Kaj no uh, Lodge knocks him out, you know, <laughs> beats him up in his office. Really, just really does. Attacks him. <clears throat> you know, that w w we're a little more sophisticated today about constituent service, but, and uh, there's a, a new guy, and of course the c cops come and they arrest the guy who gets, who has, who's been beaten up. <laughs> It's a, and, and how'd you find that little tidbit? Gosh, I don't remember, Brian. I, I, I did all this research. I mean, cause you, and that makes the point. This book goes, it, it's a lot of territory, a lot of history. Right. Well, you know what's interesting is how it's easier to do research now than it was. Um, there's still no substitute, and the great historians like James McPherson, you know, just go to all these places and read the letters in their own hand. But, for instance, the papers of George Washington have been digitized, and you can, you can call them up at your desk. And when we're done, you could go and call up letters he wrote and they're indexed and if you know how to search, you, you search. So I, as I got into this, I would, I never heard of this case, of course, but something, somehow I came across it and then I went to the Senate archives and there they are, online. You took a shot in this book, if I got it correctly, at some historians. Yeah. <clears throat> and some who have been public and political? Well, Sean Wilentz and Arthur Schlesinger Jr., after, during impeachment, had this, had this petition. And, you know, the petition was, well, this thing would eviscerate the power of the presidency. This would, you know, they, they sounded like if the impeachment happened, the whole power of the presidency would be gone. And Clinton was impeached, and in a very close party line vote, virtually part of my vote in the Senate. He defeated the Articles of Impeachment and he was not convicted and he served out his term. So even after impeachment, there was enough energy in the executive branch that Clinton was able to, you know, do all the things he was doing, see through legislation, appoint judges, pr start a war in Kosovo, and a, a war of liberation in which he protected people, Muslim people as it happens, from ethnic cleansing ugly little euphemism. And, and in fact, Clinton had enough 
energy in the executive. He even had another scandal before he left office, the pardons. And he left office with high approval ratings, and inst helped install his wife in the Senate, um, and is believed by many, many Democratic activists that if Gore had, Al Gore had used him more, uh, Gore would have won. I don't know if that's true or not. We'll, we'll never know that. But so, and so, so it seemed that these historians had been hysterical and overreacted. They never apologized or, to my knowledge, said, oh, we were wrong. And in fact, then when the war comes in Iraq, these same people have a petition, oh, no, 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 we don't want the president to do this. Congress has to vote on this. Only Congress has this power. Now, it certainly says that in the Constitution, but Congress hasn't exercised that power since 1941. I mean, this is, and they know this. And so they sort of seem to switch sides in this debate, this philosophical point over how much power the president was. In a Democratic president, they wanted him to have all this power, and they feared taking away, and it's a Republican president, then suddenly they, they're all about Congress. And it struck me as sort of obviously and overtly partisan. And I, I, I don't think historians ought to be doing that. I think they ought to be doing what, what journalists are trying to do, which is attempt to be fair and objective. You can't always do that, but you try. And so, but I, but I give them, oh, the mildest of shots. I mean, the books, as you point out, pretty positive. But then even after saying that, I go on to say that some of these historians help me, the very people I criticize. And in fact, as I got into the writings, because you have to read, you know, William Lee Miller and James McPherson, McCullough and Will Entz and Shuster. You have to read these people to do a book like this. And their, their scholarship and their writing is so impressive. And their commitment to these kids, because all, all these people are still teaching classes, you know, most of them at the undergraduate level. And so I came away, actually, with this great respect for them, even though I'd, I was irritated going in. So, How often did you call a historian? Oh, constantly. I mean, Who was the most helpful? Oh, they're all so helpful. But everybody I asked was helpful. Frank Grizzard of the papers of George Washington was just wonderful. But I, I hate to single one person out. Every single person I called was helpful. It was uh, there was a there was a fellow I forget his name right now. He wrote a book about um, uh, Robert Gould Shaw, uh, the the Massachusetts 54th, the integrated regiment, the well the black regiment, and he he disappeared. He was. I didn't know, I couldn't find him. I sent out sort of an all call, you know, an email. And he writes back from, from uh, Copenhagen. He's, at, he's in Denmark. And I wanted to know one, this is the kind of thing, you know, you get fixed on. Did, did Shaw really sing the John Brown hymn as they marched into Harper's Ferry? He implies that in his book. He never quite says it. So he called, yeah, I left that letter out. But yes, he did. And that's the kind of help I got. It was just wonderful. You dedicate this book to two men, yeah. and I'll read it. The book is dedicated to the memories of Michael Kelly, a journalist and a friend, and to a gallant young man from Massachusetts, First Lieutenant Brian M. McPhillips, U.S. United States Marine Corps. Why those two men? Well, they were friends of mine. Brian, Brian was a family friend, a young, I'm really friends with his parents, and he went to Providence College and enlisted in the Marine Corps and went to Iraq. and. My, Michael Kelly, of course, was a well-known Washington journalist, and, and uh, he went to Iraq. And, and I was worried about both of them, and I actually said some prayers for them. And, and uh, they both died there, killed, within 24 hours of each other. And it, it was a very sad time at our magazine, National Journal, and very sad time for the McPhillips family up in Massachusetts. And I just I thought that this would... I felt like doing it because there's nothing else I could do for them. I wish there was something I could do for the families. And, but they both got this idea. They, they, were, they were happy warriors and for the right reason. Um, um, Brian, uh, my wife sent Brian's mother a clipping that was in the Washington Post, you may have seen, about this, a woman in Iraq who'd been raped and brutalized by Saddam's secret police and her husband had been killed for no reason that they married. She married a, a, a man from India. And this in Saddam's Iraq, that was a capital offense. And my wife sent this clipping to, to Brian McPhillips' mother. And she, said, and she said, well, that made her feel better. She said, Brian, Brian loved women. And Brian would, this is what Brian would have been trying to stop there. And so. 
one of the, uh, in, in pursuit of happiness in war, you go through a lot of background on how many people in this country have been killed. Yeah. And you went into some detail. I mean, World War II, for instance, you broke it down. The, <clears throat> well, actually in front of me is Civil War. Yeah. And you broke that down, those who were actually killed in combat and killed by other causes, coming up to a grand total of about 659,000 and 52 deaths, both North and South during the Civil War. You did the same thing when it came to the World War II. What, why? Well, the in, slavery had to be ended, and Lincoln knew it, and it was ended, but it wasn't, the cost was so frightful to people that after that war was over, most Americans, I don't think, questioned that the cause was just, but what they questioned was war itself. And the Civil War, I believe, started or, or helped foment a deep strain of, of pacifism in America, in, in, within America. And so, you know, we're a warlike country in some ways, but we also have this experience now that all of the European powers have had. Now we understand really how, how costly war is after the Civil War. It's the first modern war, really. And Ever since then, in a run-up to a war, there's been a very fierce debate. And I have a chapter on, on, the, on this, this strain, that pacifism really is what it's about. But, and I don't mean that in any pejorative way. I mean the people you know, who, who really think that war is so, e so horrible, the cost of it, that we should always try and find some other way. Um, and I, I, you know, the, the book sort of advocates extension of these rights, even by arms if necessary, but it's been, ex it's been extended by other ways. Um, there, I finally had to write about some, some other leaders other than wartime presidents, Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Martin Luther King, who, who, who pursued the extension of rights through peaceful means, too. And they also employ these people, the language of the preamble of the Declaration. And they have as good a claim to it as a wartime president, I think. How often did you find these words, pursuit of happiness? Well, and and the Jefferson words, I mean, actually from the Declaration. They're constant. But what I was looking for was more not just people sort of using it as a throwaway line, but people using it to make their case, and which Martin Luther King did when he came to the United States. And he said those words were a promissory note. And I'm, I'm, we're here to collect them on that note. And it was used in that direct fashion. And in fact, well, Frederick, Frederick Douglass would, and Lincoln used those words constantly. And, and in a time when within the abolition movement, there were sort of two, there were two schools. One was led by William Lloyd Garrison, who thought that the, the document, the Declaration and the Constitution, these two documents in our, my little booklet were tainted because they'd been written by slave holders and they and they seem to the Constitution sort of incorporated slavery into the governing structures of the Senate and he burned the Constitution and Declaration at a famous speech and said they're they're packed with the devil he was a secessionist from the other side but Douglas argued and Lincoln argued that the words themselves were so powerful and their meaning so obvious that the sins of the people who wrote them was secondary, and that we didn't need a new government, we just needed to live up to the creed of the Declaration. And that debate was, within abolition, was won by Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. And, and so they have used those words. And so that's the kind of thing I explore in there. I'm not so interested in people, you know, of a parade just using the phrase. I'm interested in how the words came to be understood by Americans as, as obliging them to grant freedom to other people. What was your reaction when you found Ho Chi Minh using them? I, well, I was delighted. Um, Where'd you find it? Well, that, I wish I could remember, Brian. That was just one of, one of those things you come across and you can't hardly believe it's even true. I don't speak Vietnamese and his, lang his speech, Ho Chi Minh used his speech, 1954, used our language and in fact, set it up like Jefferson, you know, when in the course of human events kind of speech. But I called a scholar who'd written about a Ho Chi Minh biographer, and he said, yeah, that Ho Chi Minh had done this, and he'd done it deliberately to try and show the Americans that they didn't, 
that this, they didn't want to pick up the mantle of French colonialism, that that wasn't true to our, our traditions, that our true tradition would be to support the, the desire of the Vietnamese people to, have, to be free of colonialism. Now, I guess it worked for a while, but obviously it didn't really work because we went over there anyway. Did, what was it, what happened to you, <clears throat> excuse me, what happened to you during this period of research? How long did you research? About a year. What happened to your whole perception of the Declaration of Independence and this preamble over that time and the attitude that you found people had about it? It didn't change me in a way, it re but it reinforced something that, uh, and that is, there are all, I have a very big tent view of patriotism now, I, and I did before, but it, but the Ho Chi Minh, I end one chapter with Ho Chi Minh and begin the next one with John McCain. Now, you talked to him? Yeah, yeah, and McC McCain, McCain is one of the few non-presidents that, that, that I, that I, talk about there because he's an important figure to me and I mean I think in this world he and he writes about how being in prison in a North Vietnamese prisoner war camp helped him really understand America's values and and really helped him become the fully patriotic American and he's a guy who sort of both sides in Washington even in this polarized town he, he's a person who commands respect across the spectrum and one of the reasons why is his he has a good sense of country, and people respect that, and he's, he's paid the price. Um, but he also helped lead the opening to Vietnam. He's not vindictive, and he's not, he's, he's very old school, but he's also very modern in his thinking. But, what it, but the answer to your question is, I, I realize how, I realize that the people are arguing now, they're petty little scholars, I have little patience for that. I don't think much of it matters. I think what matters are the big things. And I think that these, and like I said, these presidents and these immigrants who think that America is still special and that we have special obligations, I, I came to believe that's right. Who's the happiest person you know? That's a good question. Huh. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> My book's full of happy people, but some of them are dead. And are you happier knowing all that you know from now that you've studied this history intensely? Or would you be better off if you're just ignorant of all this? No, no, I think if you read this book, people come away and think, well, all right, America's gonna be okay. We make a lot of mistakes, but we're gonna be okay. We're, we're, we're heading in the right direction. Why? Why are we headed in the right direction? And are we different than others? Well, I don't, I don't know if Americans are different than other people, but this country has a different, has a history. It's a, you, you, realize, you realize why it's so difficult for the, the Palestinian state to take shape. Because, because the organizing, what are the organizing principles of it? Well, they want land, they want to be, they want to, they want to have their own country where they don't have to, you know, go to, through Israeli checkpoints. And that's not a small thing, I, I'm, I'm sure. But what are the principles? What are the great principles? And this country was founded on some great principles. And if we're true to them, if we're true to them, the whole world's better off. That's to me an optimistic message. Did you find people misusing this concept? Hey, you know, I you would, got into the yeah, but John I, Calhoun and his son and well, Calhoun was a you know a racist and an opportunist, but he didn't really misuse it. He the, sure some of these the Southern secessionists, you know, they, they, even they didn't misuse it. They just said Jefferson was wrong. Well, I don't think he was wrong. Lincoln didn't think he was wrong. No, I don't, it's hard to misuse them. People have a right to use them any way they want. They have as much right to those words as I do. So, what do you want people to learn from this book? I mean, how, how much of it is the history of it? Well, because you do, you go into some, you go into a lot of corners in this book. Yeah, I, well. And you quote, and you make a point that you quote a lot of people extensively. Well, why did you do that? Well, because you know we. Well, I've been to I've been to like presidential conferences, even academics, even let alone nightly news, where people are talking about presidential communications, how a president communicates, and then they won't really quote the president. They'll give a little snippet, a word here, a word there. Um, you know, it's commonly said by some of Bush's political adversaries today that Bush 
never talked about human rights in Iraq. He only talked about weapons of mass destruction, for instance. Well, that's flatly incorrect. He talked about human rights in Iraq as a reason for war probably a hundred times. But he wasn't quoted very much. We don't really quote presidents the way we used to and the way we should. And so in my book, I thought, well, that's unsatisfactory. If I'm writing about how a, how a president's and words moved a nation, I'm going to have a chunk of the quote. And maybe I went a little too far with that. I don't know. But I, those quotes are powerful. Because presidents tend to be pretty articulate when they're talking about freedom. After um, you finish this book, who would you put on the top of your list of people you respect the most? The presidents? No, just everybody. I mean, the whole one you... The, well, the, some of the things, you know, I mean... Who would be your favorites? Look, you know, Babe Ruth really could hit. You know, the conventional wisdom isn't always wrong. Lincoln was great. George Washington was great. But you mentioned Babe Ruth, and that's an important part of your whole concept here, baseball. Baseball. Why baseball? Baseball is something that makes me happy, and I use it because it's a, a, a frame of reference. I don't even know if it's still the national pastime. That, for all I know, that's basketball today or pro football. But, but Bush used it, and, and, and Giuliani used it, and these pictures of the 9-11 of, the of Giuliani as Yankees uniforms at the game stuck in people's minds. So it's a frame of reference that helps and George us. Washington, you point out. George Washington played played catch at Valley Forge for hours. Um, what do they call it, fives? Fives. There were different names. It's it sort of derived from rounders, but it's, a, you know, it's evolved steadily here. Abner Doubleday did not invent baseball. I guess I can say that on this show. He didn't. <laughs> so, again, you look back, the people, people in here that you want to read more about, did you? Well, read? well, there are so many. I mean, all right, the obvious ones. You know, Roosevelt, Lincoln. George Washington, Jefferson. I mean, Jefferson and Adams, you know, I don't, there's a great fight going on. To this day, the New England people love Adams and thinks he gets short shrift and think Jefferson was a slave-holding racist. And the Virginians think Jefferson was the brightest man ever walked the planet. Well, hell, I don't have to choose between them. I like them both. I'm from California. Um, but, but there's some other great people that we don't remember. Calvin Coolidge never really said the business of America's business, not really. What he was talking about was to newspaper writers, and he was telling them that he, that I knew, he knew they needed to make money, but he trusted newspapermen to always put the public good ahead of business. That's what he really said. Uh, Hoover, who, you know, to this day, you go to a Jackson Jefferson Dave Dinner, and some, some Democrat who wants to be president will rag on Hoover. But Hoover was a great man who gave his whole life to public service and saved millions of people from starvation, one guy. One man. Um, I think I think Carter is an underrated president. Uh, you know, people laugh at me in the city when I say that, but I, from my lights, he, he got it. Uh, you know, I I think I think Reagan really was Reagan's sort of unembarrassed promotion of freedom around the world. I think will be remembered. Long, you know, not in the sneering way that today's intellectuals look at him, but as a great thing. What are, um, what's a young person to think when they pick up your book and read this quote? Quote, while I'm talking to you mothers and fathers, I give you more assurance, FDR told the cheering crowd. I have said this before, but I'll say it again and again and again. Your boys are not going to be sent into any foreign wars. Well, and that's 1940 campaign, right? Right. Yeah, it's October of 1940. Wendell Wilkie's listening on the radio and says, he's cost me the election, right? Is that... Well, what's a young person to think? They, I, I hope they got to read the whole chapter because what I'm, I'm using that as, a, I'm not trying to make Roosevelt into a disingenuous guy. What I'm trying to do in that chapter is show that there's this natural tension. Candidates for president are very leery of war even a candidate who's already president. But presidents are also commanders in chief. And then they begin to see the reason that they may have to go to war. And that's a very natural tension. And I offer it, I hope that young people will be reassured and that this debate we're having about Bush and Iraq, which at times is very vitriolic, too vitriolic for my taste, but it's a healthy debate and it's the debate to have. And for, pre for, for a, a candidate to say, well, oh, yeah, I, um, well, I wouldn't get involved in that foreign war. That's, he's responding to this pacifist strain in America because it's a country that understands how awful war can be and the costs and these people who die, like young Brian. But the commander-in-chief gets in and understands that if the, if the Kurds are to be free or, 
or the Germans or the Japanese or the Filipinos or Chinese, there's nobody else to do it. And so it weighs heavily on him. And so presidents tend to be more martial and candidates more peace-loving, but that's a very healthy dichotomy. In the middle of all this, you did this book also. Yeah, I did one third of that book. I was, I've been very busy. But one of, <laughs> one of the authors, authors uh, of this book, Boy Genius, about Karl Rove, is a man named Lou Dubosin. He's got another bestseller out right now, which is not exactly positive on George Bush. Is that, did that worry you? No, there, well, but there's all the, you know, there's these books out, you know. We're, we live in these times. I mean, the, you know, the book, uh, what are some of the titles, you know? So-and-so is a big fat liar. George Bush never has told the truth in his life. You know, lies, 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 lies. And then the other side, yeah, that's the left wing and the right wing. All Democrats are traitors, you know. They've always been traitors. Traitor, treason. I, this book, my book's not like that. I don't write like that. That's not how I see things. Boy Genius is about? Boy Genius is about Karl Rove, but, you know, and I, I got no quarrel with Lou. He's a good guy, but I think my third of the book reads a little different. I would... I think that's fair to say. The tone of it's a little different. What did you think of writing this book? Well, it was it was sort of a labor of love. I just really had something I wanted to say. I don't know if I said it well or not, but I think I think I'm onto something. I, I hope people will read it. And Have your kids read it? Um, my son's reading it now. It's just out, you know. How old is he? He's 23. Just turned 23. Wants to go to law school. So now he's interested in constitutional law. Has he said anything about the book that you want to repeat? No, no I, just, I think he was a little surprised. The old man thought deep thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> this is the cover of the book. It's called The Pursuit of Happiness in, in Times of War, and our guest is Carl Cannon, White House correspondent for the National Journal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, there are people who, at these universities, this is what they do. Uh, David Myers is one. There's, uh, there's others. But what does make people happy, well, but very destitute people aren't happy either. They can't be happy, really. Eleanor Roosevelt right, talked about this, and I, I quote her. But for people in modern America to be happy, they, they have to have a sense that their work means something, and that they're listened to in the workplace, and that they're contributing to society. I, these are very reassuring things to find out. So the article was published. Was there a reaction to it? Yeah, I don't know. I don't remember. So how do you get to the book, though? I mean, oh, well. I, by this time, I had more I wanted to say, a lot more. And uh, Larry Sabato of the University of Virginia, another person you know, called me up and said, I'm doing this series of books on American political challenges. And what he's, what he's really doing is trying to line up writers for this publisher, Roman and Littlefield. And do you have anything that you think you could write about American political challenges? I said, well, Larry, it just so happens I do have something. And I told him, the outline of this book over the phone and then in an email and he forwarded it to Roman and Littlefield and they they loved it and of course it goes against I mean my father's written many books and all my friends said that's totally not the way to do it you have to get an agent you have to do this you have to do that and this was an academic publisher who gave out a pretty small advance but by then I just wanted I had something I wanted to do I had something I wanted to say and I just and I thought all right what did they do to transform themselves what, what were they saying what they were saying was, in Giuliani's case, he was telling Americans to go to the theater and go shopping, and Bush was telling people to go to baseball games and Disney World. He even said that once. And I thought, are, are they, what is this? Are they missing the boat? And so then I began looking into this, this language of the preamble, which both those men cited. The pursuit of happiness, Americans' right to pursue their heart's content, even during war. And I wondered if these two were right, or if they were all wet historically, and I decided to look into it. Did Forbes publish the article? <laughs> Forbes did publish the article, and uh, what what and, was the date on it? It was you know December of 2001, and it was and it was all kinds of leaders, not just presidents, but all kinds of people. And and that it was Forbes ASAP. It was mostly a you know business sort of pursuing your happiness, your dreams, and entrepreneurship is what their thing. But the presidents interested me at this point much more than business leaders. And so I began to look at all the wartime presidents back to really, well, even back to Jefferson and even George Washington. Had you ever <clears throat> thought about the Declaration of Independence at any great length? No, not really. 
I like a lot of Americans. I think I, that language is out there and I like it, but I had never really even written about it. Where does it come in the Declaration? Well, it's right. It's the preamble. I, I, I carry it around with me since 9-11. You know, it's, it's right here. It's the very beginning. Carl M. Cannon, author of The Pursuit of Happiness in Times of War. What gave you an idea that this would be a book? Well, Brian, I didn't, I didn't know it was a book right away. But I had been asked by a magazine, Forbes magazine, to do a, a, a piece about the living presidents. They were doing an end of the year thing on the pursuit of happiness. And they said, could you interview some of the ex-presidents or get them to write? And so I did that. And it was a funny thing. I'd heard presidents say, you know, life, liberty, in the pursuit of happiness a hundred times probably. I never really thought much about it like most Americans. Um, <clears throat> but then 9-11 came. And I had this stuff in the can, these interviews. I, um, I emailed George H.W. Bush, Bush 41. I said, you know, do you want to change anything you wrote? It's going to look kind of maybe frivolous. And he wrote back and said, no, no, I don't. And he'd written about his happiness of his personal life and his wife and his kids, and he'd taken pride in them. And uh, I thought, I thought there's something there. I didn't know what it was. And then after 9-11, you remember Rudy Giuliani and Bush sort of emerged as these commanding figures. But before 9-11, they had, Bush had been as marginal a president as a, as a president can be absent a scandal. And Giuliani had made himself into something of a joke. Suddenly, within hours in Giuliani's case, and in, he'd emerged as a hero. And within days in Bush's case, he's emerged as this forceful wartime president. Okay, can I read you the first couple of sentences? Sure. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinion of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. And then Jefferson starts, the causes. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and that they are endowed, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that's, so the preamble is only, you know, the beginning of the declaration, and I only take the beginning of the preamble and build my book around what those words mean to Americans and how wartime presidents and other national leaders in times of crisis have used those words to galvanize Americans. When did Forbes magazine specifically come to you? What was the date? Do you remember? It was summer, maybe spring of 2001 so before september the 11th right. what, what got them interested in well the they person? just said i think they do it this was an end of the year project that they were doing and they were looking for a freelancer to help them i'd written some stuff for them i you know i cover the white house full time as you know and uh, for national journal they're very good about letting me do an occasional project like this so forbes called they were just interested they were just kicking it around they had no of course inkling that those words would take on a greater meaning very soon when they came to you, did you consider yourself a happy person? And do you consider yourself a happy person now? Yeah, I do. I, I do. I, maybe that's just ignorance on my part. But yeah, I'm, I'm the, the last paragraph <laughs> in your book. A native of San Francisco, Carl attended the University of Colorado, majoring in journalism. He lives in Arlington, Virginia. He and his wife, Sharon, have three children, ranging in ages from 8 to 22. Carl pursues pursuits include fly fishing in Montana thoroughbred racing opera and playing amateur baseball in an adult hardball league does that say it all you see how my job gets in the way of my life I'd have <laughs> does it <laughs> but I love my work remember Phil Burton you remember Phil the congressman yes. from San Francisco every time I call him I came to Washington and he was like my godfather though Phil wasn't particularly religious or Catholic but and he would uh, he I, I called him and he said, anytime you need me, you know, call me. Because we're old family and friends. I never really did call him and I feel bad about it because Phil died young. But every time I talked to him, he'd always say, are you happy in your work? And I realized that that's really the key thing. Those other things are great fun. But if you're not happy in your work, you don't have much of a shot. This, I have a chapter on happiness, on what happiness is. At some point in the book, I felt, probably should have done it earlier in the book, but I did it late in the book. Well, wait a minute, what is happiness? And so I got, did research into the most current social science, and it's, it's, it's what you might think. Money does not make people happy. Riches and wealth does not make people happy. How but, do you know? 
Well, there's there's studies. 